So next one is uh, Sujal Desai. He's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome here today. He's a consultant radiologist and senior lecturer at uh, uh, King's College, and uh, his particular expertise is interstitial lung disease, among other things. So he's going to talk to us about uh, how to evaluate respiratory failure. Thanks, Sujal. <coughs> thank you, Luigi. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I think the first thing to do is to take my tie off. Uh, everyone's without ties, so I don't see why I have to wear one. Um, I'll just put one on for politeness, but there we go. Um, yes, so, thanks. Uh, it's a great honour to be here. It's always a pleasure to be invited to non-radiological conferences, but don't tell my radiology colleagues I said that. Um, I am interested in interstitial lung disease, but I'm also interested in um, uh, ARDS, and that comes from my time uh, at the Brompton, where I was a research fellow, and I did some work with Tim Evans and David Hansel. Okay, uh, let's make a start. Uh, I think I've got about 20 minutes. Um, I think it's a testament to everyone in this audience that, uh, you know, because of your constant state of increased anxiety, that increased numbers of patients are surviving. Uh, but I suppose I have to add as a radiologist that imaging tests, and I hope you would agree uh, with me, that imaging tests are important in the investigation and management of your patients. The chest X-ray, the humble chest X-ray, is the workhorse investigation. And I think on a day-to-day management basis, the chest X-ray is important. But I am going to focus much more on CT um, in this talk. There are some questions, I think, we can address. Uh, what are the principal roles of these imaging tests? And I'll kind of just touch on those as we go through. Does CT really add anything? And I hope I can convince you that CT probably does. And that kind of leads on to sort of prognostic information that we're getting from imaging uh, tests. So there are three sort of principal aims that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to consider the very basic radiological aspects. Now, Boris introduced some new terms, twitchy lungs, and I think there are a lot of misconceptions about imaging. I mean, CT tells you one thing and one thing alone, and I'll come to that uh, in a bit. So over-interpretation of CT, I think, is a problem. Uh, I will review some of the specifics of uh, the imaging of the injured lung, and then we'll talk about some of the value in terms of the pathophysiological insights that I think CT has provided um, over the years in patients with uh, ARDS. So what is it that imaging is useful? Well, I'd be nothing if I wasn't able to provide a diagnosis, and Boris has hinted at diagnosis of ARDS, and we'll, we'll uh, talk about that, and particularly how CT plays a role. Obviously, in terms of the management of your patients, imaging tests are there in terms of support. They uh, are there to assess progress and also to assess resolution. And uh, Boris also showed some very nice examples of patients getting better, which is what we all want. Uh, and of course, we will be there in terms of the detection of clinically unsuspected. So, you know, these patients are complicated, and sometimes the imaging test will provide clues as to what might be going on, which may not be detected uh, clinically. So what about the diagnosis of ARDS? Well, it's always worth having a bit of a historical perspective. And now, as far as I know, this is the first paper that kind of introduced the whole concept of acute respiratory distress. The paper by Ashbaugh and colleagues published in The Lancet way back in 1967. And they described essentially just 12 patients who presented with a variety of sort of background uh, predisposing factors. But they identified that these patients had similar sort of clinical presentations. These patients were breathless. They had hypoxia, which was difficult to treat. The lungs were stiff and they had infiltrates on the chest x-ray. And that was, for a long time, the definition of ARDS that was used. And as I'm sure we can all agree, this is open to pretty broad interpretation. So the fact of the matter was that actually trying to compare data from different centers, from different uh, uh, regions, was actually very difficult because of these very broad criteria. Then, as I'm sure you know, in 1994, the Europeans and the Americans got together and then decided on some consensus criteria. And they made this distinction between acute lung injury and full-blown ARDS, essentially based on the physiology, the PAO to FIO2 ratio. And but for all other matters, the criteria showed that they were similar. However, even this was not perfect. And then, as a result, <clears throat> this Berlin definition, I think Luigi was involved in this, was proposed, propo uh, published in JAMA, because there was a lot of questions which arose. I mean, what is meant by acute? What do you actually mean? Is there a sort of time factor in there? I'm, I'm no expert on physiology, but I'm told that the POFIO2 ratio is crucially influenced by PEEP. This is what I am interested in, poor observer agreement. Now, Boris talked about infiltrates, and I have to say this term atypical pneumonia really irritates me. When I see that on a report, at the bottom of the report, the subtitle should be, I don't know what I'm talking about. Because atypical, what does that mean? I mean, for the organism, it's typical. Right, yeah, so atypical pneumonia is a useless radiological term. Whenever you read that, just discount it. Yeah? It's, it just doesn't mean anything. So I never use that term. 
And also in the, in the uh, consensus criteria, risk factors were not included. So I think the new criteria, uh, and you know, they are there summarized in the table taken from the paper, I think will help obviously to define and categorize patients much better and make, comp uh, and make a sort of comparison between different centers uh, a lot easier. Now, what we do know about, a little bit about, is the sort of pathology. And our pathologists will tell us, and particularly the lumpers uh, and the splitters in the pathology will say, look, there are different phases of ARDS. So there is this exudative phase where you'll see some thickening on the interstitium. There may not be much in the air spaces, but as time goes on, as those uh, alveoli get flooded, we'll go into a proliferative phase, and then eventually there is a stage of healing. Now, that sounds really neat and tidy, but actually, the fact of the matter is, these are sort of overlapping phases. However, that said, we can relate it to the imaging because in the exudative phase, usually within the first 24 hours, the chest X-ray will probably be normal. Now, you could, if you give it to seven different radiologists, you'll get seven, probably eight different opinions as to what this chest X-ray shows. But generally, in the first 24 hours, the X-ray will be uh, uh, classed as normal. As the alveoli and the interstitium get flooded, so we'll go into this so-called proliferative phase, and then eventually, as it goes into a phase of healing, you may see signs of fibrosis, but that's very difficult to interpret on a chest X-ray, and that's because it's a two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional anatomy, and that's why we get this observer variability, and that's what I was kind of hinting at when we were talking about um, you know, infiltrates on a chest X-ray, quite difficult. I think Boris hinted at that in his, in, uh, in his talk, but in the, in the paper published in 1994, there was this distinction between the pulmonary and the extrapulmonary causes of ARDS. In other words, did the ARDS start off because of direct trauma to the lung, or is it because the lungs are kind of joining the party because of sepsis elsewhere, pulmonary and extrapulmonary ARDS? And this categorization is useful when we consider the imaging, because when we look at CT scans, if you look at enough CT scans, they do fall into roughly two categories, depending on the time that these patients are imaged. If you image these patients early enough, they will fall into one of these two categories. There is this pattern on your right-hand side, which is the gradient that Boris was referring to, this gradient from front to back. And what do I mean? Well, if you look at the lung here, it's pretty well aerated, it's black. Air is black on CT, and I'll come to that uh, in a little while. And as we go further and further down, it gets darker and darker. So there's this gradient of density, relatively symmetrical from front to back. By contrast, this is also a patient with the RDS, and you can see a much more patchy appearance. There is ground glass pacification in the background, but there are also these dense areas of non-dependent, dense pericular pacification. And these are the two categories of CT scans. And we can call this the kind of typical appearance, and this is the atypical appearance. And is this of any value? Well, yes, it probably is. And this is a study I undertook with Tim Evans and colleagues when I was at the Brompton. And it essentially, if you kind of do the math, as the Americans would say, actually, there is a way to kind of categorize these patients. So in patients who have pulmonary ARDS, you have a lot more of these blotchy areas of dense parenchymal pacification, non-dependent. And that kind of makes sense. If you think that pulmonary cause is a common cause of pulmonary ARDS, might be aspiration or infection, not atypical infection, normal infection, then it makes sense that why would it just be in the dependent lung? It's more likely to be in the non-dependent lung, and it's likely to be pretty random. And indeed, when you look at the typical and atypical appearances, so the typical appearances goes much more with the extra pulmonary causes. So when you see a CT scan that looks like this, with this gradient from front to back, which is very, very symmetrical, actually that's more likely to be an extra pulmonary cause, non-pulmonary non cause of ARDS. In contrast to this, this more blotchy, non-typical appearance, actually is much more in keeping with pulmonary causes of ARDS. So that's something that can come through from imaging and CT in particular with regards to the causation. At a slightly later stage, the pulmonary causes of ARDS are tend to be associated with more complications, so more uh, pneumothoraces, cysts in the lungs. And again, that kind of makes sense. The lungs tend to be, if we believe the literature, the lungs tend to be stiffer. And so in the pulmonary cause of ARDS, you tend to get more cysts and the effects of barotrauma on, uh, uh, on CT scan. Now, ARDS is not always in both lungs. So in patients who've undergone pneumonectomy, ARDS can be very, very asymmetrical. In fact, it can be unilateral, as shown in this paper by Simon Padley and uh, colleagues, and showed that paper, patients who are undergoing resection 
you tend to get ARDS in the non-resected or the non-operated lung. And you can see again, here's that gradient from front to back, but it's quite clear that you can get asymmetrical or in fact unilateral uh, ARDS. Now I'm not gonna dwell too much on monitoring of progress, but just to make the point that X-rays, you know, we've all seen X-rays that look like that. Can you get any useful information from it? Well, you might be able to. And in fact, this was a small study published in CHEST a few years back now, and essentially it showed that the position of the tube may be an important clue as to why these patients are getting uh, recurrent pneumothoraces. Now, not surprisingly, in patients with ARDS, you have a higher proportion of recurrent pneumothoraces, and the tube position or the tube orientation may be an important clue. So if you see lots of tubes which are orientated roughly horizontally, that will predispose to more pneumothoraces. And that kind of makes sense because a horizontal tube position would tend to suggest that it may be trapped within a fissure or may be trapped at the base of the lung between the uh, lung surface and maybe the diaphragm. So clues from the chest X-ray, which may be uh, important in terms of the management uh, of ARDS. Okay, so enough about sort of plain films. Now, what does CT do? What is CT all about? Now, CT first and foremost is a measure of physical density. That's all that CT is telling you. There is a certain density in the lung. Now, the people who invented CT, and I kind of use that, use that term a little bit loosely, so Godfrey Hounsfield and those very clever engineers said CT density in terms of the lung is basically governed by the amount of air. So lungs have lots of air in them. Air on CT is black. That's basically the physics of CT. How do you change the density of lung? Well, the only way you change the density of lung is by changing the amount of air in the lung. Okay, if you reduce the amount of air in the lung, the lungs will become white. And that's really all that CT is telling you. So this is a normal CT scan, normally aerated lung. Obviously, you can see the vessels, but most of the lung is black because <laughs> air is black. If you displace air from the lung from whatever cause, whether that be blood, whether that be inflammatory cells, whether that be tumor, it doesn't matter what it is. If you displace air, the lungs will become whiter. And that's really all that CT is telling you, the changes in the amount of air. So you can actually do the sums, as it were, and you can characterize lung according to its density. We know that normally aerated lung has a value of around 500 to minus 900 household units. If it's any more than that, we're probably looking at empecematous or overexpanded lung. As you displace air, or as lung becomes more poorly aerated, it becomes whiter. And that's essentially what you're seeing in the ARD, ARDS lung. And you can do that kind of analysis and show that normal lung is essentially with all the pixels displaced to the left-hand side. And as you displace the air, as in patients who have got lung injury, you start to make the lungs whiter. And actually that shows that this curve kind of shifts to the right-hand side. So you can start, if you apply numbers to the pictures, you can start doing more interesting analyses. And that's actually something that is a credit to Luciano Gattinoni and colleagues, because they first realized all of this and started doing these basic analyses using CT, applying numbers to the CT, and then tying that up with the physiological information. And in fact, it was Gattinoni and colleagues who actually nicely showed that, contrary to what you might expect, the low compliance, which is characteristic of ARDS lung was actually related to the proportion or the lack of normally aerated lung parenchyma. And that kind of led to that concept of the so-called baby lung in ARDS. They've done more sophisticated analysis. So you can look at CTs, as I'm sure you all know, and see how patients, whether or not they will recruit. And if you compare low pressure versus high pressure, you can see in this patient very little difference between the five and the 45 centimeters but if you look at this patient, clearly, in a very visual way, you can see between 5 and 45 centimeters the difference that it makes. So lung recruitability is something that can be studied just in visual terms, but also if you do the, do the uh, quantitative analyses, you can actually then see how uh, CT contributes to management. And that was one of the ways in which people showed, again, it was Gattinoni and colleagues who showed that actually this is not, this gradient from front to back is not just related to gravitational differences in the way edema distributes. This is actually just collapsed lung at the back. And it's just more exaggerated in ARDS. And we see 
collapsed lung in normal patients. If any of us lie down on a CT scanner for long enough, you will see these dependent areas of increased density. These are areas of collapsed lung. Now we can show that very easily because nowadays on multi-slice scanners, you can do coronal reconstructions. And this is just a band of atelectasis in this patient and this just reflects collapsed lung at the back. Part of this collapsed may be uh, uh, related to the heart or the heaviness of the heart, and we know that the lungs of uh, the heart of ARDS patients are heavier, and actually this contributes even more to this dependent atelectasis, and that's been shown in a number of studies, again contributed to by uh, CT. Now, in a curious way, this dependent uh, increased density at the back probably protects, although in the acute phase probably contributes to hypoxia and the shunting of blood, but in a curious way also probably protects the lung from the effects of barotrauma. Because if you compare acute phase with survivors or CT scans in survivors, there is a relationship in what we see in terms of CT patterns. And this is a patient who, you can see the acute phase, has a nice gradient of density from front to back, very dense parenchymal pacification, largely be, uh, related to collapsed uh, lung parenchyma, whereas in the, uh, in the survivor, and this is six months down the line, you can see all this reticulation and fibrosis in the non-dependent lung. And here are three more patients, uh, uh, one here, one here, and you can see again, but there is a theme here. If I draw a line across here, all the abnormality in the survival phase is in the non-dependent uh, lung, and that's probably related to, as I think Boris already hinted, the effects of uh, uh, barotrauma. And in fact, if you look further down the line, you can see that on CT, actually, as your reticulation in this anterior uh, part of the lung increases, so it has an effect on lung function and indeed on quality of life score. So there is a relationship between what we see on CT in survivors and also what is happening in terms of their breathlessness and also in their overall uh, quality of life. So quite a lot of information from CT uh, is being gleaned. Finally, just to finish on uh, prognostication, uh, we've talked a little bit about what we see in the acute phase, but not, it's not just about this gradient and this increased density at the back. It's actually sometimes it's in the airways, and the airways provide a vital clue as to whether fibrosis is being laid down. ARDS, as I'm sure you all know, can be a very fibrogenic process. We know that from what the pathologists tell us, but there are clues in the imaging which tell us that there may be fibrosis, and the clue may be in the, in the dilatation of the airways, and that's been shown in a number of studies. These are just some examples there. And we know from uh, um, more uh, analyses of BAL fluid that actually pro-collagen peptide 3 levels are elevated in, in, in patients with ARDS, and that may be an additional marker of the fibrogenesis that you see. And in fact, if you look on imaging terms, then as I already hinted, if you look at the airways inside areas of ground glass opacification, that, that dilatation of airways is linked to outcome and linked to prognosis. So there are important clues on, on the imaging. So in that rapid run through, I hope I've shown you, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you agree that imaging tests are certainly integral to the management of these critically ill patients. The plain chest radiograph is still important. It's performed almost on a daily basis and it is a useful sort of workhorse investigation. CT in the day-to-day -day context, I think provides a useful sort of supporting role, but I think greater work with CT and further work with CT will continue to provide us with pathophysiological and I think also prognostic insights as I've just hinted at in this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.